Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Dr. Melissa Batchelor, and today I'm joined by Dr. Mark Williams, and we're going to be talking about the five secrets of aging. Um, he's the author of a book by that same title, so welcome, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'm really delighted to be with you and your audience today. And we're glad to have you. So um, before we get started, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll dive into the five secrets. Sure. Uh, well, I'm a practicing physician. I was in one of the very earliest cohorts of physicians in America trained in geriatric medicine. I uh, did my undergraduate training at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and my residency there and then my geriatric training in Rochester, New York. And I've been very interested in aging uh, really since the mid 1970s. And uh, been thinking about how we should grow old and uh, in distilling my thoughts. I also have been interested in medical history. And one of my uh, role models was a physician named Herman Borhov, who was a Dutch physician in the latter 17th and early 18th century. He was a great clinician and kings and philosophers and heads of state would come to see him in his little clinic in Leiden. And uh, after a while, his uh, colleague said, Professor, you are so brilliant and have so much knowledge, you really need to write it down so that it can be stored and saved for future generations. And Borhoff pointed to a large book over in the corner and said, it's all written there but no one can read it until after my death. And so as uh, the fate that happens to each of us, uh, Borhoff died, the scholars eagerly looked at the book and quickly discovered that every page in the book was blank, except for one page in the very center. And on that, Borhoff said, here are the secrets to medicine and long life. Keep the head cool, keep the feet warm, and keep the bowels open. So in three <laughs> secrets, he uh, distilled things down. And that got me thinking, well, I'm not as uh, much of a, a parsimonious thinker as Borhov, but I think I can do it in five secrets. And so that's what I hope to share today. Okay, that's funny because that was actually the exact same word I was going to say to you. So, but yeah, that was a parsimonious um, list of secrets. So, um, but yours is still pretty parsimonious. So, why don't we um, start with the first one? What is the first um, secret to aging? Well, well, the first secret is to know the reality because medical science has really advanced by leaps and bounds over the last uh, few decades. Uh, so that a baby girl born today has a better than 50-50 chance of living beyond the age of 80. Now, let me put that into context. In 1900, uh, well, back in the days of the Roman Empire, 2,000 years ago, the average life expectancy at birth was about 35. Uh, and uh, in 1900, the average life expectancy was 47. So basically, it took mankind 19 centuries to increase the lifespan from 35 to 47 or 12 years. And now, just over the last 100 years, we've increased the life expectancy from 47 to 80. The problem for me is no one's celebrating that great advancement. And most of us are living in the past without motive views and stereotypes about aging. So the first basic secret is to know the reality. And the reality is not that bad. So what is the reality? Each of us has a realistic chance now of living to the age of 80, if not 85. And it's likely not going to get any better than that. Um, we have a number of views in our society that look at old people as being doddering old fools and stereotypes. And these destructive myths are really, are really terrible. So what is it about understanding the reality? A fundamental principle 
is that 75% of our mortal hazard, that is to say, how long we're going to live or our longevity, has to do with our environment. It has almost nothing to do with health care. It has to do with clean water, a predictable food supply, having a safe place to lay your head down at night to rest. And only 25% has to do with health care. The other key message is that we have considerable control over our aging and our longevity. So the bottom line is we have control. We don't have to leave our aging up to the winds of fate. And so there are a lot of things we can do to uh, prolong our quality of life and uh, even our length of life. Right. I think the um, one of the main topics that we do talk about on this podcast is the, the impact of ageism and the fact that it is the only self-imposed ism um, that we have of all of them. Uh, but how you think about aging actually matters too, because if you have negative aging beliefs, meaning you're buying into the stereotypes and myths, it can actually decrease your life expectancy by seven years. Oh, that's um, true. And and not only not only does it uh, how how your work environment is. Uh, so it's not so much socioeconomic status, although that certainly plays a part. But if you work for a boss who's a real jerk and that work environment is very hostile and uh, difficult, then even if you're uh, making millions of dollars in a high pressure corporate situation, your longevity is going to be threatened and you're going to lose longevity. So you're absolutely right. Uh, there are a lot of hostile myths and stereotypes in our environment. Uh, one of the key ones is ageism, the myth that all old people are the same and they're falling apart. And that just does not celebrate the individuality that occurs as we grow old. Uh, the facts of the matter are that we are become more unique and differentiated and less like one another. So that again, the the key aspect of aging is we have choice uh, and that our environment plays a huge uh, influence over our longevity. Now, right. some, some, some of your listeners may say, well, now, wait a minute. What about risk factors for various diseases? What about heart disease and diabetes and other diseases? And those factors are part of what is called proximate cause epidemiology. So life course epidemiology says 75% of our mortal hazard is the environment. Proximate cause epidemiology looks at the specific diseases that will knock us out when we get to uh, 80 or 85. Um, so that the risk factors for heart disease and stroke and all of the killers that we talk about are important, and we can deal with them with uh, appropriate uh, modifications, but it's not going to add that much to our life. So again, we need to remember that there's a difference between uh, proximate cause epidemiology, what disease do you want on your death certificate, and the fact that 75% of our longevity is related to the environment and things that are under our direct control. Right. And so I think the rest of your four secrets probably um, speak to that. And the way I think about that is more about lifestyle choices. So what is the second secret to aging well? Well, the second secret is to challenge your body. Uh, so this gets into exercise and activity. One of the things that seems to relate to aging very directly is the creation of oxygen-free radicals in our biochemistry. And very simplistically, a free radical of oxygen is one where the oxygen molecule has lost an electron. So normally in the oxygen molecule, the, uh, the electrons are in pairs, kind of like uh, a couple at a square dance. And if all of a sudden an electron is lost, then that oxygen becomes positively charged and goes off and seeks another electron and shamelessly steals it from wherever uh, it can find a, 
an electron. So it can be the cell wall, it can be DNA. And it's thought that free radicals of oxygen really strongly biochemically relate to aging. So what does this all have to do with exercise? Regular exercise helps our bodies deal with uh, free radicals by reducing the production of free radicals and increasing the defense mechanisms in the body to free radicals. Um, so the other aspect is diet. Diet also can help us with our free radicals. So uh, people sometimes say, well, okay, I believe that exercise is important. What exercise should I do? And the real straightforward answer is it doesn't matter as long as you do it. So regular exercise for about 30 continuous minutes a day is really the key and helps us to increase our defenses to oxygen, free radical creation, and quenching free radicals to keep them from having uh, their uh, destructive effects. But you might say, okay, how much should I exercise? You mentioned 30 minutes a day. What Exactly what should I do? And the best advice I've ever gotten in this regard was from an old farmer who was over 90 years old. And I said, what is your secret to longevity? And he kind of had a quizzical look on his face. And he said, you know, Doc, I ain't got no secret, but I will tell you one fact. I worked up a good sweat every day. And I think in some ways that is the best distillation of how much exercise you need and the fact that you need to do it every day. The George Washington University School of Nursing has three highly ranked online master's program options to help you get there. Check out our adult gerontology nurse practitioner in either acute care or primary care and our psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner programs. All three are in high demand with excellent starting salaries. Applications to start our programs in the fall are due each year in May, and to start in the spring, applications are due in October. You can learn more and get exact due dates by visiting our website, nursing.gwu.edu. Right, and speaking of kind of old sayings, um, that's a great one related to um, physical activity. The one that my mom always told me that our, the country doc you know, that when we, when she was growing up, told her was that you eat breakfast like a king, you eat your lunch like a queen, and you eat your dinner like a pauper. And then the United States, we kind of flip that around and do most of our eating at the end of the day when the body has less time to, to process it. So, um, so those are great tips around diet and nutrition. And so what would be the third aging secret? Well, the first Please. again, know the reality, challenge your body. The third secret is to stimulate your intellect. So for many people, losing your memory is one of the greatest fears of uh, growing old. And the real fact is that we don't have to uh, lose our intellect. Uh, yes, there are diseases that people can get, but those are diseases. They are not normal aging. So in my clinical practice, I really pay careful attention to three important symptoms. The person who says, you know, I'm having difficulty remembering people's names at social events. Or the person who says, you know, I go into a room and now forgot what I went in there to get. Or the car, Larry, I opened the refrigerator door and I forgot what it was I was going to get. And the third key symptom is forgetting where you placed your car keys. Those are all three symptoms of being perfectly normal. They are not early warning symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So these are things that everybody does. They're not uh, symptoms of uh, dementia. Now, our memories do change as we get older and our uh, recall gets more slowed down. So recalling things becomes a little more difficult, but recognition does not. So we can identify something that we've recognized before. And uh, in a way, I remember an old African proverb that says, the young man tries to provoke the water buffalo and tries to outrun it. 
The older person has a different strategy and steers clear of the water buffalo, but if it's provoked, climbs a tree and gets out of the way. The point being that our strategies to solve problems become more mature and elaborate as we get older. So yes, we have some memory difficulty, but I'm gonna say to you and your viewers and listeners that in a way, memory loss in old age is a myth. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that the more successful we are, the more we create routines and habits. And these habits spare us dealing with unpredictable circumstances or having to develop resilience and adaptation to life events. So we create a comfortable routine and we allow our mental skills to atrophy. So if we maintain ourselves with active pursuits, then our memory does not have to change and in fact might get uh, even uh, uh, more uh, greater. And there's a lot of strong evidence to suggest that there is no upper age limit to human creativity. So with uh, aging, our memories can become more enriched and varied and uh, intricate. Uh, they don't have to become old and worn and we're not, we not destined to become senile and forgetful. Right, and so building on kind of the free radical theory of aging, that's kind of the use it or lose it theory. Uh -huh. And I also think that, you know, the problem solving stuff that um, improves mostly because of life experience. And so that kind of supports intergenerational workforces where, you know, you, you have put older and younger workers together because older workers do have more experience. And then the other thing that you made me think of with the habits and the routines some of the, if you develop healthy habits and healthy routines, it, they can actually have a protective effect because I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about artificial sweeteners. And I was like, you know, I just buy stevia. And I was like, when did I make that decision to buy, you know, that that's just the sweetener I was going to use. And it had to do something with the impact, you know, some of the research that was coming out about art, artificial sweeteners, but then that just became a habit. So I don't have to think about it anymore, mm -hmm. but it's protective too. Same way that we have routines about the types of food that foods that we eat and our exercise programs. Um, so I guess, well, I'll, I'll let you interject. Well, no, I was just going to say that I think that in some ways there's an artificial poverty to our memory. And what I mean by that is if I were to ask someone, uh, do you remember the capital of the United States? And they would say, yes, I do. Then if I said, okay, think about the capital, and I know you can identify it, um, how many steps are there from the uh, front uh, plaza to the doors? And the answer is, I don't know. The reason is that our memories are not photographically that detailed. So that we tend to have a composite of a memory that's not really photographically accurate and allow us the level of detail that we really thought was there. And the problem is simply that if we think that we should know the number of steps up to the Capitol building of the United States, the, the point is the, the information was never there, not that it was there now, and we've just forgotten that it was there. So again, uh, when we think about our memories and think about why do we remember what we do remember, I think that those memories are warm and fuzzy compilations of a variety of different emotional experiences that we pull together and then view that as a single memory. But the reality is that it's probably an image that could not have been photographed at the time. So if we're thinking about a happy family event around some holiday, the odds are we're going to mix and match three or four different childhood memories 
together in one and not really have something that we could truly remember. And again, if we can't pull it up with photographic reality, it's not that we've lost it. It's just that it was never there. Right. And I have a tile in my kitchen that says, we don't remember days, we remember moments. And you know, I know I've done um, some prior podcasts about kind of the role of emotion and memories. Um, and so all those things do matter. So I actually got this, asked this question on a podcast earlier this week or last week. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some specific ways that you would recommend that people kind of stimulate or their intellect? Well, I think there are a couple of ways. I think if you believe like I do, that habit really affects our memory and that we spare ourselves the um, degree of adaptation and uh, the need for resilience in dealing with unpredictable circumstances, then what we need to do is in a safe way, break our habits. And what I mean by that is uh, perhaps twice a week, brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, twice a week, brush your teeth with your left hand. Confront your brain with a novel challenge. Um, If you have a favorite place that you always sit to watch television at night, then try rearranging the furniture. Sit in a different place. Confront your brain with a novel place to to view things. And this uh, research comes from stroke research where they stimulate the brain to do novel activities. And it stimulates a substance in the brain called neuron uh, growth factor. And this neural growth factor is kind of like a miracle grow or rapid grow for nerve cells. Because it turns out that while we're losing neurons every day, that is not something to uh, obsess about because we lost most of our neurons the moment we're born. And a vast majority of our total neurons in our brain are lost in childhood. So yes, we lose neurons, but like a tree in the forest that's struck by lightning, if a tree dies, all of the remaining trees re-sprout their neuronal connections. So the dendritic arbor is uh, becomes more complicated. And it turns out that by maintaining these complications by stimulating your intellect, trying to remember a new poem, do something different, uh, play a musical instrument. Uh, If you play a musical instrument, if you're used to playing one style, try playing a different style. If you're a piano player, if you play classical, try playing ragtime, try playing something different. And those unique differences stimulate our brain cells so that we sprout new neuronal connections and possibly form enough new connections that that forms the architecture of what we call wisdom. So again, stimulating our intellect, doing new things, doing varied things, uh, being on a podcast for the first time, uh, having uh, interesting (laughs) conversations, uh, all of these things are Uh, things that help stimulate our intellects. Right, and that kind of ties back into the human creativity. Um, And my dad actually is uh, 71 and has just recently started learning to play the guitar and taking guitar lessons. And I was like, that's great for your brain. My mom's like, yeah, but not so good for my sleep if he's playing at six times. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, yeah. All right, so the fourth um, aging secret. The fourth aging secret is to manage your emotions. Holding in powerful negative emotions is a fantastic aging accelerator. So if we hold in a lot of anger and fear and upsetness, then that's kind of like going down the highway with your foot stamped down on the accelerator and your other foot pressed down hard on the brakes. You may be going right at the speed limit, but everything inside is churning way too fast. I believe it was the Buddha that said, anger is like holding on to a hot coal. If you are holding on to it to throw it at someone else, you're the one that's being burned. Mm -hmm. 
And so that I think it's important for us to appreciate. And again, I, I just think about a story that was told to me by uh, an Indian medicine man who said a uh, Indian chief was approached by his son who said, chief, you're a wise and old person. Uh, give me one bit of wisdom that I can take with me. And the chief said to the son, remember that inside each of us are two wolves. And one wolf is filled with hate and destruction and fear and envy and jealousy. And there's another wolf at battle with that wolf that's filled with love and compassion and care and generosity. And these wolves are at a continuous battle. And after a while, the son came back and said to the father, which son wins the fight? And the Indian chief looked down and said, the wolf that we feed. So again, it's important for us to realize that our own inner states can do a lot to affect and reflect our uh, aging and our sense of love and compassion for others. And that is how we help to manage our uh, emotions. Right. And so those are um, good examples of kind of our own emotional experience. So what are some other ways that we can kind of help manage our emotions through our support networks? Well, I think it's uh, really important for us to appreciate the fact that we're going to grow old and we're going to die. So how do we deal with that? Um, one of the lessons that echoes clearly throughout history is that people who give help to other people when they need it tend to get help themselves when they need it. So again, by having uh, unselfish service to other people really is a way to help uh, manage our emotions. But it's tricky sometimes because we live in a society that really has a lot of negative stereotypes and uh, views about aging and older people. And we have to be able to confront those very directly uh, in order to develop a positive and a uh, satisfying outlook on uh, how we're growing old. Uh, when people are looked at as uh, valued and worthy, then they tend to thrive in those cultures. And when they're looked at as being a burden or a drain, they tend to be left behind. And that's uh, sad and unfortunate and unnecessary. Right. And I think it goes back into, you know, whatever ideas you feed yourself, you tend to attract more of that. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the fifth um, aging secret. Okay. So we've talked about knowing the reality, challenge your body, stimulate your intellect, manage your emotions. And the fifth secret is to nurture your spirit. Now, I have to confess, I'm a physician. I am not an expert in spirit nurturing. And so I'm going to speak freely. But I believe that uh, really, when we think about purification of experience, that is nurturing our experience, the purification of our experiences. And part of this is accepting our own mortality. Uh, there are a lot of important statistics uh, about aging, but the most important statistic of all is the death rate. The death rate in this country is one per person, and it's remained remarkably consistent for a couple of millennia. So that we have to accept the power of limits, the ultimate limit being we will all have to face our own death. Now, I'm reminded of a quote from Woody Allen, who says, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. And there's a lot of uh, uh, wisdom and truth to that, perhaps. But I believe that if we think about it, 
it becomes a matter of identification. The great mythologist Joseph Campbell said, do I want to identify with the light bulb, the source of the light, which will ultimately grow old and burn out? Or do I want to identify with the light itself of which the bulb is only a vehicle? When I think about that, I remember that Plato said, our spiritual eyesight improves as our physical eyesight declines. And you might say, well, that's all very interesting, but what does that mean? What, what are you trying to say? And one way to think about it as throwing a pebble onto a clear pool of water. The height of the waves when the pebble first hits are very big. But as the circle gets larger and larger, the waves get smaller and smaller. So in a sense, the waves are our physical presence, while the circle is the growth of our intellect and our spirit. So any specific recommendations for how to nurture your spirit? Well, gosh, there are a lot of important things we can do. Uh, we can create a sacred space for ourselves, I think, taking a little time during the day. I think we have to realize that the night uh, is the time uh, for the spirit. And so sometimes uh, when we're lying in bed, either before we go to sleep or if we wake up when we roll over, that might be a time that our spirit tries to communicate with us. And it's important for us just to keep an open mind and have everything quiet and still to listen to what it is uh, that is being said to us, uh, because that can be profoundly uh, enlightening if we uh, pay attention. Um, there are also places we can feel. Uh, in Celtic lore, they call these, there are places that are thin spaces where the uh, distance between our inner and outer worlds is particularly thin. Um, but I think that there are sanctuaries where when you go into a special place, you feel it and you know it. So if you go into a great cathedral, there's just a presence about that space uh, that, that instills reverence uh, or a library. If we can create a space like that within our home, perhaps it's a, a room or a small corner of a spot that we can create that we can feel refreshed and feel our body uh, relax. I think all of these things are important uh, spirit nurturers. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing those five um, secrets. And before we um, log off, um, you have a great parable and kind of framework for aging well. And yes. so I'll let you tell that story. Thank you so much. That Because we've talked about these areas, uh, stimulating our intellect, managing our emotions, nurturing our spirit, understanding the reality, how do we deal with each of these things within our daily lives? And a, a Sufi parable helps me understand that. And in the parable, there's a person who has entrusted a horse and a carriage by a master. And the master says, I want you to take care of this carriage and uh, care for the horse. And at some point, I'm going to come and we're going to go on a very important trip together. And so your job is to make sure everything is in good working order, because I can't give you any advance warning about the trip. And the driver gets bored, and after a while, he, uh, uh, in the sense of the Sufi metaphor, goes to a, a, a bar or a public house. In modern times, it might be uh, the driver just sits around uh, watching uh, uh, television or spending time on the internet. But the point is that uh, the driver gets distracted doesn't take care of the horse, the cart falls out of uh, repair. 
And in this parable, the driver represents our intellect. The carriage represents our physical body. And the horse represents our emotions or the motive energy that makes things happen. And so if we think about that, in order to have a meaningful trip, the cart has to be in good working order. If we have a cart that has one bad wheel, the journey is not going to be terribly relaxing. If the horse has not been fed or has it's not been trained, then we can't expect a good, safe, steady journey. Uh, and if the driver is distracted, then he will not, he or she will not be there to hear the uh, the master represent that represents our soul or our spirit, saying it's time now for us to go on our journey. So the key is for our intellect to get our body up to speed, to manage our emotions and to keep control over our passions and our desires, not to deny them, but to acknowledge them and to keep things under control uh, and to be ready for that journey. Not that the intellect knows what where the path is. And for very intelligent people, an important insight from this parable is we're not our intellect. We have to use our intellect in order to keep our bodies in shape and our uh, emotions under control, but we are part of our totality, which requires our soul to then give us the message and to pay attention to it and then to get on uh, with our journey. Yeah, I think that goes back to the um, saying that we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. That's so. exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much um, for being with me today. Um, so these are the five secrets and we'll put a link in the um, show notes and on my website, melissabphd.com for them, for people to pick up a copy of your book, Five Secrets to Aging Well with Dr. Mark Williams. So thank you so much for being with us. Well, today. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for tuning in to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my other episodes on my YouTube channel by either by subscribing and ringing the bell to get immediate notifications when new content comes out. In addition, you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please feel free to leave an honest review because more reviews mean more awareness of the podcast and helps us move towards an age-friendly world. If you have a comment or a question, you can visit my website, melissabphd.com. Go to the Contact Melissa tab, and you can leave me a voice message. You never know. It might just include your question or your comment in an upcoming episode.